Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, this is the, the Revolution of the Retail Destination Talk. Uh, we're joined by an all-star group today. Um, we, we have a it's world-class panel of technologists, developers, designers, and retailers, and uh, we're going to be hearing them discuss the impact of digital influences on the future of the physical retail space. Uh, the session is going to be moderated by Carl Boutte. Um, he's the chief strategist and founder of Studio RX, a retail strategy advisory firm serving a wide range of retail clients, including solution providers, designers, and federations. Um, now, as we accelerate to a 50-50 digital physical world, we will look beyond click and collect and digital displays to what is the e-influence on experience design and the business model to support it. Um, so we have five panelists here. Carl is gonna be joined by um, Isabel Blonde Gonte. Um, I hope I've uh, pronounced your name beautifully. She's the co-leader of Decathlon's Strategic Vision 2030 initiative. Um, Isabel is the head of architecture and international development for the world's largest sporting goods retailer with over 1,600 stores in 57 countries. Sounds like a lot of responsibility. Um, we're also going to be joined by Michel Lozon. He's the founder, president, and creative executive officer of Lab, a design innovation collective founded in 2017. Uh, we also have Claude Seurat. Uh, he is an independent consultant and former president of Ivanhoe Cambridge. And finally, we have Sam Roth. Uh, he's a partner at Mon Hill in Dubai. Uh, with that said, I will throw over the stage to Carl. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the intro. It's fantastic. And I would invite uh, my panelists to open their cameras and come off mute because uh, we're going to have a really exciting almost 50 minutes of conversation and uh, and basically uh, uh, exchange that, that sort of it, it extends and represents a, a manifesto that we're releasing today uh, that is the culmination of several hours of think tank sessions that we did together along with about a dozen um, of our of our counterparts around the world from different uh, from different angles but all concentrated on thinking about the future of the commercial destination, uh, be it a mall, be it a, 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 any kind of revenue generating property. Uh, we've had a lot of questions in what instigated uh, the think tank, uh, this is sort of informal collective that was, that was created uh, in, a, in a very COVID uh, ad hoc manner was ha having had several conversations at, at the initial stages of, um, especially in areas of confinement, we were, we were all really thinking about uh, the model and 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 one ha one after another having these conversations I thought there would be a greater opportunity to pull these fantastic people together and get them to share and collaborate around okay what are you know what are the factors that we need to consider when we're repurposing uh, or thinking about the future of of you know commercial destinations and retail and that, and how that's all intertwined and, and as we know uh, much of these dynamics were already in motion um, my, my theorem is around acceleration and, and, and how that's, this crisis is, is making us think more rapidly about how we're going to need to adapt. And what's interesting about this group is, again, it's, it's a multidisciplinary group. Uh, not, we have developers, as Jeff was saying. Uh, you know, we have architects. Uh, we have designers. And we have, a re we have a retailer who happens to be representing the strategic vision of, uh, of the world's largest sporting uh, goods retailer, too. So not nothing, as Jeff said, quite a, quite a task. So. Um, let me kick it right off and, and I'll share at the end uh, the link where you'll be able to find the report and, and go into the manifesto, which is meant to provoke uh, a greater conversation, but we thought this would be the perfect stage to, to introduce it. So uh, Jeff's introduced sort of our, our, our panel. Uh, it's meant to be, again, sort of an extension of the conversations we had. So it's a sort of a privileged look, in, look into how uh, the dynamic of this group worked and what brought us to think about the future of uh, the commercial destination, and I'll start. And just to get the, the to get the, the stage fright out of her, because Isabel is quite uh, is, is from France, from Lille, uh, heading the Cathlons group. For those of you again not so familiar in the U.S. with the Cathlon, I, I highly recommend you look into them. Or they're an amazing con sporting goods concept. And uh, Isabel, how, how are you? There you go. Well, I'm very happy to be with you and to share uh, what uh, what's happening uh, in Europe, because uh, today uh, you we have uh, in uh, opening uh, again our store and uh, we have a big uh, we need to take a big decision 
like you say, uh, what, uh, what is the future for the retail? And uh, we discover during these years, we bascule to the, to the eye. The people uh, who have um, a mobile phone could be decide and they say, I, je, uh, before uh, we discuss more than uh, real estate retail. And uh, we suggest uh, a lot of for our customer, but uh, now we move and uh, we discuss more with uh, our customer. We want to be more collaborate. We want to cooperate. And I think uh, for me, it's a big, uh, big um, thing I uh, retain for uh, these uh, few months. Right. So this kind of speaks to the acceleration, these initiatives at Decathlon, you know, where, and this was sort of the theme as well, where it so happens for, we're in the, the digital piece of this, of this conference. There's actually a store design piece that was more yesterday, but I thought it more interesting for us to sort of interject into this more e-commerce uh, part of, of, of Retail Innovation Week, because really I think what we're saying in, in, even in this manifesto a lot is digital has really upended the whole purpose of physical retail. And, and what you're referring to right now, Isabel, is the eye. I think that's great. It's, it's clever as well. But the eye of, you know, the eye retail experience is really one focused on the consumer and leveraging these digital channels into creating the new physical experiences. And being an architect by trade, Isabel, you're, you've spent the last 20 years with the Cathlon sort of even thinking of new store formats, how to enter into new markets. I mean, this is in some ways a new, a new market and a new format that we're now trying to merge into this sort of, as I say, this 50-50 world we're heading to where we even sort of lose what that difference is. So how, how are you in Decathlon thinking about 2030 right now? And, and I mean, in this acceleration, it must be very difficult to even think beyond 2021. But let's, let's just for, for, for argument's sake, talk about, you know, where's your, your head at? The, how are you going to leverage the eye customer uh, in the next couple of years? For, for us, it's very important to, to, to keep data. Like uh, that's why uh, the e-commerce is uh, very new for us because uh, before we, we just have a, a, a mortar uh, building and uh, now we need to, to learn about uh, the click. And uh, the last uh, few years, we, we need to restart, to refresh and to reinvent uh, our business model. And now with the COVID, it's an evidence we need to move. And uh, we see the acceleration of our uh, uh, internet uh, website. It's the uh, first time. And uh, like that, the people say, OK, now we do. And we need to reflect about how we can better understanding our customer. And uh, all the, um, the new decision uh, start about the people and the needs. And uh, it's very important to understand uh, personally the, the customer before we we think about global not local we need to sh to think about uh, what the needs inside uh, france inside uh, uh, canada uh, we are not the same consume before we, we we take a decision for the global world now we we reinvent a, a new business model locally we have a, a, our offer change because uh, we don't uh, think uh, we don't have the same uh, season and uh, it's um, for me the, the big start is a way of living we we don't practice the same and the digital it's a, a big opportunity to to give emotion because now uh, we we buy on internet we shop on a, on a store and uh, when you shop uh, you shop an experience you don't want anymore to buy a product it's a uh, as you, you are in the uh, United States and Canada, you know very well Starbucks. For me, this is, uh, you buy not a coffee, you buy the experience of a coffee. And uh, for us now, we need to, to move to this, uh, how you can give more uh, emotion to our sportsmen, how we can give to a mummy to come to a store and to give, uh, uh, because no difference if I don't have experience that uh, emotional and uh, the digital can help us to do that. Uh, no difference between a smartphone and our store. This is yeah. So, so maybe just for, again for for the privilege of those that don't haven't experienced the Decathlon store. And I remember Isabel a couple of years, I guess, two years ago when two and a half years ago when you opened in in, in Montreal here, just outside of Montreal. I mean, the, the buzz. First of all, we have a lot of we must say in, in Montreal. There's a lot of French uh, expats. So they, they was probably the most excited they'd been in a long time to see a retail format. And, and as surprising as it is, maybe for people on the call, they hear sort of your very uh, 
uh, sort of uh, analog references saying, you know, we're doing thinking about like Starbucks and I, these are, I, these are notions that a lot of retailers are already well engaged with, but a, 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 a company like the Cathons had so much success uh, with, with large format. I mean, the stores are incredible. I mean, they're simple, but they're incredible. It was the first store that I saw kids riding around on bikes in the store. You know, where she, any one of our other sporting stores, they, they wouldn't let you, maybe they let you sit on the bike just to see if the height is okay, but they, they sure as heck won't let you ride around the store on it or have a climbing wall or have a gym in the back to try uh, to try the rackets out. I mean, it, it really was a very analog, analog experience. And I think you're also maybe downplaying a bit your digital proficiency yes. because you, you, you are one of the first with RFID that I saw rolled out head to head. So there is some technology happening in the store, but what you're pointing at is, you need to maybe find a way to better leverage it to personalize and more and maybe hyper localize what it is the Cathon wants to do over the next couple of years. Exactly. The, the big point for us today is be, be there where we are needed. And I think we go outside of the store, not anymore. The store, it's a, a just a, um, a, a way of express a, a business model. We need to have a, a lot of uh, mm. things. We, we are not a retail, we, we are the product factor, factory. And yes. uh, this, we change our mindset about that. We want to begin a brand, not, uh, not only a signage. And uh, that's why uh, the, the digital change our mind. The digital is uh, uh, amazing tools to be more closer to our customer, to understand better themselves and to understand them. It's uh, in this, the data help us to be more uh, precise. We want to and to be more uh, custom customer mm -hmm. services and to be more closer about uh, individu individual. Uh, yeah. We want to, to be um, uh, take care about uh, now about our customer to be safety and the digital is a big um, issue for us and now I'm working uh, on a new uh, concept and uh, we we want to take this point safety uh, to to work differently with the fitting room to to work differently for the catch line and uh, for us it's a new uh, new rules for tomorrow Right. No, it's fantastic. And, and another point about the Cathlon for those is they, they, the vast majority of what's sold, and especially in certain formats, 100% of what is sold is produced in-house. It's private label. It's, it's, so it's really from, it's really end-to-end -end vert vertically integrated retail experience from like none other. So the business model evolution will be, will be very important. Um, but you spoke, you, you spoke to something interesting here and, and, and we touched about a bit, a bit on the manifesto. I'll go to you, Michelle, because I know you're working a lot on this in the current crisis is, you know, security and how are we going to think about security in the context of the digital integration, the business model? I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, you know, that we now are having to quickly adapt. And, and I know you've designed some of the largest uh, retail experiences with you know, some of your previous roles. And, and now you're doing this with lab, but you're assisting. You've got some great concepts around using public spaces. So that's obviously a security first, which I think is for the next, you know, for the for the foreseeable future is going to be the top priority. So how are you seeing this, Michelle, and how does this sort of embrick into this new digital, you know, infused uh, reality that we're, we're all uh, expressing here? Well, I think that uh, the idea of uh, we have to address the security and we have to, of course, be very nimble and very agile and do it quickly because it's on everybody's mind. But I think the, the, the true uh, top performers are, are going to be the ones that are going to be, are going to be able to, to, to segue this into the overall experience of all, you know, if we look at a, uh, a Maslow pyramid, we would say of our, our customer or our people needs is that security is at the bottom of is, is, is the base. Cause if you're not secure either physically or psychologically, you're not receptive to much because you're in danger. So you're, you're fight or flee. So I think that to address the security, of mm. course, it, and, and this has been done, uh, recently, as quickly uh, you know, as best we can, because this is an emerging field of contagion confinement. So we're kind of go, touch and go on this. But yeah. I think that the ones that truly perform are the ones that really to, to, inter, to weave it into a more compelling and comprehensive experience where you also have, you know, cultural, uh, behavioral, uh, emotional things. And I think that uh, the Catalan has a uh, uh, she, I think Isabel is underselling a bit her, her physical platform because also their physical platform had question, uh, had a new a, a revisited value proposal where it, it talked about their values and it 
interface with the client and the customer on, on issues of not just sports, recreation, but also well-being and health and, and being active and, and also interfacing and having a dialogue with the community and the context. So they were already in the analog format in this, uh, you know, in this revisited value proposal in their stores. So I think that in the short term, of course, if we go back to your question, we need to solve all these issues of you know, distancing and, uh, and managing entry and sanitizing the spaces. But in the midterm, very quickly, we need to, we need to, to think about the other dimensions of the human experience. In workplace yep. and in retail, it's the same thing. So if we want to open we, up we, shopping we, malls and we want people not just to buy, because we want people to shop. Shopping we, is a social experience. If if you go to the shopping mall just to buy, then maybe we're missing out on on the main attributes of why we're doing a physical space. De and it's definitely not. And definitely not to fight or flee, as you put earlier. This is, is <laughs> we, we, we want to get, we want to go shopping. higher in the. We want to go higher on the on the needs, and and, and I want to explore. I'll come back, with Michelle, because I you're I, what I always liked about your within the group. Your perspective was very almost like an urban development. You've always had a very broad sort of uh, view of of the role that commercial uh, real estate and retail plays into like a larger equation. And, and we'll get back to that. But you just touched on something that our, I think our friends Claude and Sam. But I'll go to you first, Claude. I mean, you know, the the, the destination. I mean, what created a destination? And you manage some of the largest projects and you oversaw some of the largest repurposing projects of our malls here in Canada and your investments around the world. But I mean, for instance, you know, what what Claude, uh, what Michelle was just referring to is, is, you know, making this a human experience. And and we had it in Montreal here, uh, the Eaton Center, for instance, the Time Out Market, which was very innovative way, you know, one of the, the, the um, you know, among the first sort of high end food concepts to reinvigorate a mall. So where where are we going with this? I mean, where are we going to take the model next so that we can speak to what Michelle was just saying earlier, the security, but also the experience? I mean, where, where's your head at, uh, Claude, with how we're gonna be able to leverage this, this new reality? Uh, thanks, Carl. Um, well, as you pointed out, and as Michelle pointed out too, we were spending a lot of time around fun, food, and fashion. This is the, those were the big themes around you know, our shopping center environment, and we were focusing a lot of, of our efforts towards bringing experiences, bringing memorable experiences around the food, uh, fun, and fashion. So if you break that down a little, um, and you know, we use the expression like you know, in the good old days, right? The good old days were like four months ago. Uh, <laughs> so in, in that's essence, right, <laughs> that's right, time flies. Um, so the the in the good old days. Uh, everything that, you know, we were focusing a lot around entertainment, around, around uh, bringing new experiences to our shopping environment that would attract a new type of consumers as well. Um, the food, um, you pointed out, uh, everybody, everybody was, you know, uh, moving hard on, on, on food and bringing food experiences. You know, in our portfolio uh, previously, it was in, anywhere around eight, nine percent of uh, food FNB in our malls, but then you know you compare it to Asia, which was you know 20, 25 percent. So what does that mean now under the new world going forward? And then fashion, last but not least, fashion, uh, who's you know obviously under a lot of pressure. There was already some sort of a polarization in fashion with the high end and the value oriented retailers. Prior, I think this this whole crisis now has um, brought uh, up a lot of you know. Unfortunately, some of, some of those retailers had issues that were not necessarily facing uh, uh, head on, and then now I mean it's, it's it's hitting them hard, unfortunately. So, but I'm I'm of the opinion I'm of the opinion that going forward in every category that we have, we will have new champions, the ones that have been that will be able to navigate. Through uh, these times, and then and then find ways to uh, reallocate capital, and having as always uh, top of mind the consumer in the middle of every decision they make. You know, I like to use the analogy of you know we went from an economy of peace uh, to an economy of war. I mean, right now it's like fight for survival, vs growth, like you know we were before. It's fight for margin. We're in a time where 
you know, every, every, everybody is under pressure to generate and, you know, uh, recover the cash flows that they used to, they used to have to a uh, VS generating top line. And then moving forward, it will be differentiation, niche, VS, being everything for everybody. Um, so for sure, this will, you know, uh, every category will move along, but it's like, uh, it's like, you know, we, we've, we haven't gone from 2019 to 2020 and everybody would like to skip 2020 go to 2021, right? But we went from 2019 to 2030. Right. Yeah, that's, the, that's, the excel, that's the acceleration. Oh, that's the acceleration we've been talking about. And, and what I think you're getting to as well is what you're insinuating under all this is that, that the business model as well is, is, is going to be a, you know, we're talking about where, where margin is generated and where, where value is created. I mean, that's really at the core of the business with the value proposition and the business model is going to, is going to be impacted. And, and then we'll, we'll get back because I know you have some interesting thoughts around that too. We'll get more specific. But before that, I want to go to the, another part of the globe and, uh, and go to, our, to the Middle East and, and Sam, who's, uh, who's also a great contributor to the group because in some ways, Sam, I mean, you were working on, you know, we're talking about 2030, but I feel like projects that you were involved with like Dubai Mall and whatever in 2015 without getting into any of the, the sensitive data, uh, you know, knowing that you, the business model, you were already seeing sort of the pressure on the business model even in the best of circumstances in economies like, like the, you know, the, the Middle East or Dubai or, or Abu Dhabi, which were, were thriving. So, um, you know, where's your hat at now within this acceleration is, are you going to 2040? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for having me and uh, everybody will come to Dubai. It's around 45 degrees here. Uh, however, on uh, your question, um, as you said, I think with the um, nature of the larger scale mixed use development, and with all of the transformation uh, we are seeing here, we always uh, tend to think uh, the next 10 or 20 years. And I think uh, we put uh, for ourselves 2040, 2050, not because uh, we see uh, these trends uh, are evolving that fast only, uh, but because we wanted also to capture uh, a high value for the longer term. Uh, as you rightly said, with all of this disruption and change from physical buying, to e-commerce, the channels, to personalization. I think, arguably, the only thing that didn't really change is the lease contract. And uh, that lease contract, if I take any old format of a mall in Canada or in the States, because they, they, they started this sophisticated uh, model first, uh, it would look like uh, any uh, lease contract in 1980s. And uh, that's the question that comes to mind. We change what we are offering, we change the structure, how we can really change this. And I'm not talking only and merely about the commercial terms, but what each party, when we say landlord and tenant, are really today offering to the other party and how they can capitalize on the sexes of each other. Uh, we talk about the data, definitely with the landlord having access to the more data, I would say, from all the tenants. Uh, looking at the tenants, looking at, them, at the things maybe from different perspectives, but I think definitely it's presenting uh, the similar, I would say, um, two forces with digital and physical. And today, it's the, the, the argument of physical and digital is no longer, I think, relevant. Uh, we agree that the digital and physical will feed off each other, uh, and together they will create a very progressive, united model. This model, I see it creating value and influencing change of both the models, but more focus on how each of them can really influence the change of the other. How can really the lease contract or the mall start really looking at the traffic of a mall versus the traffic online? Can you really adopt such a way of thinking uh, to start really charging uh, some of the uh, um, uh, percentages uh, from, from the sales or from the traffic footfall uh, to the tenant. That's one thing. The other thing is, what are the service? I would feel that in the coming 10 to 20 years since you ask about the future trends, I feel that the store in a mall will be commoditized in um, 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 a leverage. And you will think about a different thing in order for you to create the value. So, so basically, 
taking them all and making it a digital platform sounds like what you're 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 insinuating in some ways. How does how does the mall become a digital platform that can measure can, that can measure, analyze, quantify, qualify the yeah, consumer behavior? Really, I guess, and and probably not just within the mall, but beyond it as well, because it influences behaviors that go well beyond those the, those four walls. Yet the business model, the lease contract, is a very confined four wall the business proposition, right? Absolutely. And uh, this, uh, then you look at how this mall will create, as we said, value. If you, even if you start with the supply chain, why today we talk about the supply chain from only the loading base on the mall to the stores? Why can this supply chain extend from the mall to the country of origin to the even uh, uh, um, uh, the manufacturing places? And beyond that is how you create that as, again, a platform. Uh, when you commoditize uh, any uh, mainstream business, the value jump to the layer above and uh, below, as we say, means then the mall can ask uh, the tenant to work together to create a value either from transactions, e-commerce, supply chain, and as I said earlier, the mall uh, start becoming uh, really uh, a partner in creating value and moving from a physical space to a solution provider. What solutions do you want? The mall is connected to the traffic on a country level, uh, not only on a store level. And of course, with the value you are creating with all of your tenants, then you can tell them, okay, here's IBM moved from only a hardware to a solution provider. Let's uh, work with you, Mr. Tenant. Tell us what you want. Here's the physical space. Here's the digital platform. Here's the supply chain. Here we can help you with capitalizing on a city level. Also, we can look at the footfall of the mall and we redirect this flow in order to create a value for you. And guess what? We can go to the origin country and we can bring uh, for you the shipment of things rather than everybody. And again, working on a mega malls like Dubai Mall, you have 1,350 store. Uh, then you would ask how complicated is the <laughs> logistics? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that, that's a bit of a daunting a daunting task, and, I, and and we'll get back to I'll come back to you because we're gonna we're gonna get back a little more into the business model. But also interested to think about you brought up in the group how mall owners wanted to become retailers and retailers wanted to become mall owners, and, and it doesn't always work out the way they they, they thought because they're smart business people and they understand the overall dynamic. But executing on that dynamic can be a lot more complicated than it than it sounds. And and I, coming back to Isabel because I think that. She has an appreciation for that, and she was pretty transparent with us too, Isabel. Yeah, you know, you mentioned to us how um, you know you you the mall owners thought that you had perfect data to share with them, and 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 that's not always the case. I mean, we we think that retailers understand everything that's going on, but it's there's you're you're also working hard to try to keep up with 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 these platforms and having one more like a mall, for instance. And and you've looked at a lot of different formats, Isabel. I've seen some very small formats that you've done on the side of a beach to some of the largest ones you've done here, you know, uh, as part of malls. I mean, how do you see this ecosystem? Do you think the mall can can still add value to to what it is that the Capon wants to do? But when I say uh, we, we need to be uh, where we are needed, I think uh, because we talk, sorry about sport, but uh, we need to be closer of a stadium. We need to be closer. But after, I think it's a question of timing. When uh, Usan talk about lease, I think uh, it's a very interesting to have a new lease uh, uh, with a new uh, timing uh, for one month, for two months. And uh, today we can see uh, we have a flagship and you stay uh, for uh, 20 years. And uh, we go in a, in a city center, uh, perhaps you just stay three, three, three years. And uh, I think we need to, to think uh, with a different le level of uh, time. And uh, today, um, uh, I work about a new strategy. Uh, two, two years ago, we, we have uh, my uh, little decat uh, around uh, a container. And uh, the, um, what is interesting is how we can uh, compress our offer in a very uh, small, uh, small format. And after, we can have a big uh, flagship in a commercial center. But um, I think uh, we need uh, more collaboration. And uh, last time, uh, Michel talked about altruism. I think it's uh, very, very important to, to, to be all around the table. Now, I manage, uh, we manage a project. 
uh, where Decathlon is close to Stadium, it's uh, another uh, retail sport, but we are uh, com uh, complement. We are not, uh, uh, we want to be partner, not uh, back to back. And I think um, it's important like to a marketplace to offer the larger choice where, when uh, we are no uh, boundary. I think it's very important to, to, to be more closer and collaborate to be singular. My point of view, it's our uh, commercial center uh, became or become uh, singular because uh, you are in uh, in Dubai and you have a special uh, special thing you are in France or in Lille you have a specificity and I think it's very important to reinvent the the future retail with the local people it's right. my point of view yeah and, and I listen I think the Kathleen I see the Kathleen across Africa I see you know I see posts there and it, it already feels like they're getting very close to to the community that the, the, the what's what's popular in Kenya obviously isn't the same as in as in Dubai or as in Lille, although there are probably some you know tennis rackets a tennis racket but I mean the way and where it, it sort of comes to life might be a bit different in the context each time we have uh, we have the same product we we but we didn't go with the same uh, format and with same uh, the business model change we need to adapt if we don't adapt our business model locally uh, it's not okay Oh, yeah, Michelle. I mean, Isabel was just saying. I think it speaks to kind of one of your passions again of of creating larger experiences and and now we bring a sporting store to a stadium. Obviously, seems seems very uh, you know a great you know, a great approach. But I mean, how you know when you look at urban design, what is the what is more and more the purpose of the commercial destination within this larger scope where it's you know there's there is the store next to the stadium. There's the store next to the office tower. There's there's the, the community centers. I mean, there's this, this really interesting dynamic, which is either urbanizing or de-urbanizing, so depending who you want to listen to. But where do you see the sort of the, in the overall, the bigger picture, where, what's the role of the commercial center going to be, you know, within this very diversified dynamic? Well, I think that's exactly the point. I think that uh, the, our, our model right now or the platform, we're at the end of a cycle, and I think this has happened before. And I think that we need to, at this stage, to rethink how, because the mall is a platform. It used to be a department store, or there's still department stores, but they're struggling too. And there's flagships. All of these are, are, are areas, are trade platforms, or, or a theater of operation where people exchange goods. You know, and that's, if you go back, if I, I give a historic uh, perspective on this, uh, back in the Middle Ages, and this is a long time ago, <laughs> The, the Hanseatic League in Northern Europe were building towns. They had a navy, and these were trade people. Why were they doing this? And in, in, in France, in 14th century, they were building towns and fortifications and walls and housing. Why? To create a tra a, a, an area where people could trade goods and have social relevant, uh, relevance. It was irrelevant. It was, it was compelling. People would live there. And then... Once you once you build that platform, then revenues the revenue streams come. So again, we're a bit at this stage where we need to rethink. And I think that the the retail platform of the future, I think, has to be has to have altruistic usefulness. It's right. And what beyond I'm the transaction, is, beyond the transaction, beyond the transaction, beyond the lease. I think if a retail destination wants to, to, to be the place to be, it has to offer something to its community. It has to be relevant. It has to create value for external stakeholders also, not just for the shopper. So I think there are ways of doing this to create that, that external value proposal to, other, to, to a wider constituency of, of stakeholders and still make it uh, profitable. Right. I think the platform needs to re-become uh, irresistible. You know, when, when, when they were doing uh, department stores, it was irresistible. Yeah, Why it was... was it irresistible? Because they were building the, the, the modern downtown. They were building skyscrapers and they were doing department malls, uh, department stores, which was actually a retail street, but on multiple levels. And that Absolutely. was creating retail, uh, real estate value for other people because it was clearing uh, land where people went and where there was a lot of foot traffic. It was creating foot traffic. It was creating real estate value for other stakeholders. So it was very relevant and it was disruptive and it took the whole stage because it was creating that value. So I think today 
we need to rethink how to create that value. And, and there are attributes that the physical destination has, and we talked about it earlier. It has a, a grasp on local demographics. It, it knows consumer behaviors in that area. It has data, and it could be a purveyor of, uh, as we said earlier, it could be a generator of foot traffic, of experience, of memories, and it could be a data provider also. So I think yeah, there, speaking, the attributes are there. Speaking to Sam's point earlier, absolutely. So Claude, the question I keep on getting, and I'm sure this is what you're getting, as especially now as the independent mm -hmm. consultant who's seen the, the back end of the complexity of, of doing a lot of what Michelle just brought up. I mean, the first pushback we always get and, and is the terms, the, the, the horizons. And I think that's sort of fundamental to the stress we're feeling right now between the tenants and the landlords. We're working on different horizons. We're working on different business models. One is very variable. One is very fixed. So the comment I often get from the developers are like, how am I going to value my asset if I can't predict revenues in a stable fashion, sort of like a, any other asset class, you know, where they want to have some sort of predictability built in. What are you like? What are you answering to these to these people thinking about how the model is going to have to evolve to better meet that variability? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what we're going through right now will this be the electroshock that you know was needed to reset the foundation of a relationship between the landlord and the tenant? Uh, there is no doubt in my mind. I mean, that it, there is. It's very uh, uh, conflictual right now. Uh, there's a lot of tension. And then hopefully out of that tension, there'll be uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, solutions, and Sam alluded to some earlier, that will come out of it. Obviously, for me, um, you, know, you have to understand the food chain, right? You know, when you start and you have the idea of building a new project, okay, you have to, you know, uh, you go and you have, a, you have, you have to have your, your capital uh, to build that project. You have to go and then, and then borrow, borrow money and then everybody's going to look at, okay, what, what, is, what is your income stream going forward and how solid, predictable that income stream is going forward. So that whole food chain, right? And then at one point in time, you have the appraisers that are going to come and say, okay, your asset is worth X compared to how, how much you pay to build it. So you have that, that, that entire food chain that I think needs to be revisited uh, somewhere somehow. And then uh, Sam alluded to it earlier about data. Absolutely, data will have a key role to play going forward between uh, uh, you know the landlords and the retailers to openly share that data. But I'll add another layer up to this, which is trust. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, 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 trust is like love, right? Uh, both people have to feel it before it exists. So right now, that trust is not there, unfortunately. Uh, we've had, you know, experiences before where retailers are reluctant to share data. Uh, I, and I'm hopeful that going forward, they'll be more open to share data, uh, which eventually will allow uh, everybody in the ecosystem also to have a different perspective about sharing risks. You know, you alluded uh, uh, about, you know, developers stepping into uh, retailers' shoes and buying retailers' Um, you know, yes, we can have another hour and debate, uh, you know, why they're doing so. But at the end of the day, uh, is this defensive? Is this offensive? You know what? This is, I think, the way to go in, in, in making sure that they understand, you know, that we all understand what people are going through now in, in ensuring that they offer an, an experience that will allow the, the convergence of offline and online and the logistics that uh, uh, also was alluded to uh, earlier. So yes, the fundamentals behind the relationship between landlord and tenants and retailers will need to evolve. Um, and I think the circumstances are forcing it uh, uh, going forward, which will establish the base of a new uh, uh, relationship between the parties, but uh, trust will have to come into play. And, um, and data will be, uh, uh, you know, will, will play a key role. And then, you know, then we'll be able to have a different look uh, at uh, how we uh, develop, uh, manage uh, uh, projects going forward and continue to bring uh, memorable and, and, you know, uh, experiences and a lot of the consumers that come and shop into our shopping environments. 
and hope and hopefully find ways to monetize all that and, and still and still clear clear some have some money left over at the end. Yes. Sam, so I mean, this kind of speaks exactly to some of the stuff you are you're involved in. You're in a good position to be between those two realities. Often, I think you you again you were you know sharing how and what Claude was just alluding to retailers wanting to become uh, property owners because they feel they have better control, and so that sort of eliminates the trust paradox that, that Claude was just just referring to, and vice versa, where the mall owners are saying, "Hey, we can do." we can do retail as good as, you know, we, we can buy brands and we can represent in, in parts of the world, be, be, be the brand and the location at the same time. I mean, how, what's the, how's that experiment playing out for you? What do you think this acceleration is going to, is going to create to, you know, is that adding value or is it just making things worse? Well, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the, the approach to it, I don't think is the right approach when you see it and saying, okay, because the rents are high and because we want to uh, have a little bit uh, of uh, more control in ourselves, then we can open our own mall. And with that, the entry realized that the transformation from a tenant to a mall developer, it comes with a lot of other challenges, but also it would require different skills and the capabilities today, even from the um, uh, most, let's say, innovative parties on the tenant side and on the mall side, you'd require the base of experience on how uh, the physical space and everything in terms of operation all the way to the uh, um, uh, e-commerce or the online platforms for a mall with the integration of the city would work and also thinking about how this model would evolve so it's not easy really just to uh, let's say to skip uh, the uh, commercial terms or uh, the control or to get more data to jump on the other side. Now, don't forget that uh, uh, each party, either the tenant or the shopping mall developers, has a lot to do. And I think if each of them focus on their roles and their future changing role, uh, that will uh, uh, really benefit uh, both parties because all the, uh, of course, uh, uh, traditionally the shopping mall developers, when they jump to be uh, uh, retailers, they uh, started with the big boxes in order for them to create a competitive edge. So lots of examples around the world of malls who owns uh, a sister company as a retail uh, that really trade in the supermarket, in the cinemas, in the entertainment. So it gives them the leverage. But again, I don't think uh, today with all of these uh, models and brands, you really uh, fall short of attracting or bringing the right brands. Uh, mm -hmm. I to link this to one point was mentioned uh, earlier, which is, again, we come back to the model, uh, commercial model or the agreement model. We come back again to the trust. If each party trusted that the other party will give them the best service, we come back to the solution providers. And uh, this trust will automatically uh, be translated into each party really believing that they will do their part and they will let the other part uh, really um, uh, works. Now, my last uh, point and this uh, uh, question is back again to the structure of this big destination. Today, the structure of this big destination with all of these evolving and changing trends. Some of the shopping malls, they're saying, okay, can we have 20% of the lease area with a fixed tenant and 80% becomes a store as pop-up store? That means it's programmable, it's changing, it's a short-term leases, it's responding to the community needs, but more importantly, it's reflecting what the consumer behavior within this mall. And slowly within five years, the 80% changeable pop-up become 20%, and the 20% fix become 80% when these tenants prove with the data and with the footfall that they are the right people and the right place and they are creating values not only for the mall, but also for themselves, and more importantly, for their customers. Yeah, and it, it reminds me last year on the uh, at NRF, we presented a report that uh, Coca Cola actually had commissioned around the future of the convenience store, and and what came out really was a report th through Cantar was that the store, the, the, the format of the store, literally had to change. I mean, even during the year. So when we're talking about variability, agility, percentage of space occupied, I mean we almost have to come to a place where we're going to be able to build these large 
destinations that can sort of expand and contract or at least or, 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 or adapt to, to the time of the year? Is it more you know, logistical? Is it more consumer facing? And, and, and sort of, so there's a lot of interesting, uh, a lot of interesting uh, ideas around that, but it's hard to move a wall. I mean, and that was literally what the kind of what the outcome was. You're going to basically need stores. You're going to be able to move, move walls because you, your purpose through the year is going to change. Um, so we're wrapping up we're in, our, in our last five minutes and, and what you just brought, Sam, as well, reminding me, I wanted to, you know, we just look at the two big news stories this week in our world. Lululemon getting, you know, acquiring a technology fitness company. Uh, Brookfield Properties yesterday, uh, yesterday announcing a major investment in a 3D uh, uh, clothing uh, sizing, you know, group that so that the, you can just walk in, get size, and right away know what what you're going to. So it sounds like not only are retailers wanting to be, you know, thinking about becoming commercial developers, commercial developers be wanting to become retailers. Everybody wants to be a technology company because they they recognize that they're the value, you know, they're, the way they're going to be valued going forward. The multiples they'll probably get from investors if they're even considered remotely being an, a technology company is. I think is going to make them greater, but also makes them more makes them more agile and less dependent on 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 just one one format. So it's a big question. It's something that maybe our next manifesto we're going to have to see is 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 you know is can can the commercial destination become a technology company? And we had some people in our group, including some data scientists and AI people, that were I think very prone to that approach. But I I still think from the conversation we just shared uh, with the group, you know, this is very stimulating. The idea is there's still a lot of physical, emotional. Uh, altruistic purpose to a destination that goes beyond just what ones and zeros can can probably deliver. So, on that, I just want to quickly one minute wrap up, uh, starting with you, Isabel. Any last words? Any things you want? And I'll and then I'll share the link for the manifesto. Uh, for me, uh, the last point is sustainability and safety. I think uh, during the Vision uh, 2030 with our group. Uh, what is a very uh, revelation it's uh, people want to uh, talk about health and I think it's before COVID and uh, we have two pillars during the vision will be uh, and was um, digital and sustainable and I think it's uh, two filters for to develop our company tomorrow. Absolutely. And, and it is something that's important to talk about. I think we didn't, our, our one, maybe one of the short sight sighting where we were short sighted in this manifesto was talking about sustainability. We had one colleague in Singapore who's an architect, Jean-Sebastien, who, who cares a lot about that and wants to use this as, as, as Claude was talking about the opportunity for a reset in the business model. I think there's a lot of people that are hoping this is going to be a reset as well towards thinking more about sustainability and, 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 he and healthy living. Um, Michelle, I mean, that's sort of your thing too. I mean, you were, where are your parting words? Well, I think in closing, I think that the leaders of, of the next value leap are going to be, are going to be the ones that are going to create that new platform. Uh, you know, and, and it, I think it has to include outreach to, to city and community. I think that's an essential and local relevance. I, I think that's a thing. I think that mm -hmm. data is an essential component to be a data provider. To come back to the purpose also to be a traffic, a foot traffic generator. Uh, and I think it needs to be, uh, of course, sustainable and more resilient for sure. And I think more agile. I, and, you know, and we've done this right now, the, I think, something that's very deep and going to be very prevalent in the next wave and even in the next six to 12 months is going to be agile retail, pop up quick, quick time to market, test, prototype, uh, measure, correct, repeat. I think ephemeral adaptive retail is probably a component of that next, a big component of that next platform. Right, which is pretty much the startup playbook you just described with the the whole the whole agile the whole agile sort of framework that we were we were referring to and, and tying into that the sustainability piece, which makes it that much more complex. Claude, final yeah. words. Um, in closing, I would say that uh, let's not look at what we can salvage from the past, but what we can you know become in the future. Uh, let's push boundaries, challenge convention, and dream of what the future can be. You know, we're going to be bombarded with all kinds of negative, negative news, uh, you know, in, in the coming months, but it's an opportunity not to be missed to redefine what our business uh, is going to be, what our indus industry should be, what our uh, relationship, partnership with retail partners uh, can become. And uh, this is a golden opportunity to shake things up and look at the future.
Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have a, they say the old uh, Churchill quote, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste is uh, probably more true than ever. And especially when we think about how, you know, maybe the, the expectations from the investors might be a little more open than they were uh, a year ago into how they want to, uh, in, in what formats they want to invest into. Sam, final words. Well, um, uh, I think uh, we uh, very much define our business model on what we produce. Uh, and I think the future will teach us to forget about this and focus uh, on how we produce things and why we produce things. And that will uh, link to the solution uh, system uh, because uh, that will uh, define the relation between the shopping mall that you will work and the tenant and the future. Thank you so much. So, I mean, um, I'm just going to share. So, we basically have this report available on studiorx.ca or a manifesto, as we called it. It's it's a short. It's not a long read. It's just sort of uh, highlights some of the thinking you just uh, you just saw, and uh, and it's available for download. And you know, call BS if you want to call BS on us. Uh, improve our thoughts. Bring them forward. I think the important thing here with the with, you know, there's a very optimistic view. Uh, that came out of this this past uh, you know 50, 50 plus minutes of where the, where we can go from here and and how we can sort of rethink the you know the purpose the design the business model because it's 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 not you know it's going to evolve like everything else it needs to evolve and I think the people that contributed to this uh, manifesto who I deeply again want to thank all of you uh, the, you know for joining today and, and the ones that helped to contribute to this report which was truly a global effort too by the way not just having some and. In, in, in Dubai and Isabel in France, but a team in Nepal that helped put the report together that I want to thank as well. And, and, and all, our, all our colleagues from, from Shanghai to San Francisco that, that, that were a part of it. So thank you everyone for, for being here with us today. I hope you learned something. Are you exposed to maybe some new faces that we don't see all the time on these stages as well? And, and, um, and more importantly, some new thoughts and inspirations. So thanks to uh, Pierce, Jeff, PSFK and all and uh, hope to see you again sometime soon on a stage somewhere around the world. Thank you.